Good day, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to our APRU SWM uh, Global Lecture Series. I'm Kumuduni Palansuri from Korea University, and I also I am serving as the Secretary of APRU SWM program. So before start uh, today's lecture, I would like to invite uh, Andrea Bibiana to provide the uh, technical instruction for today's uh, webinar. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us in the third session of Global Lecture Series. As Komuduni mentioned, I'm going to collaborate with the webinar logistics today. Here are some recommendations to consider during this event. This is a webinar mode, so you can listen and see the panelists, and it's possible to interact through the following tools. We have enabled two chats. You can ask questions to our speaker or panelists anytime through the Q&A chat, or in the general chat, you can leave comments or share important information. If you are interested to talk and ask a question, Please raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can interact directly with the panelists. This is an international event, so we kindly ask you to use the English name all the time. Thank you and we hope you enjoy this event. Thank you, Andra. Uh, the Global Lecture Series uh, is organized by APRU Sustainable Waste Management and Program with, where we, Professor Yong Se Oh uh, at Korean University serves as the director of this program. This program is co-directed uh, by Professor William Mitch at Stanford University and Professor uh, David Wood at Nanyang uh, Technological University. Uh, this uh, third lecture of API Sustainable uh, Waste Management Global Lecture Series will be delivered by Dr. Carlos Guerra, uh, Integrative uh, Biodiversity Research in Germany. At the end of his presentation, there will be a Q&A session. Uh, I encourage all the attendees to participate the event act actively and come up with your questions for the discussion. Now, I, I would like to invite Professor O to give a warm welcome to attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yun. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yong Shigok. Uh, who is the director of April Sustainable Waste Management and chair of this session. So, as you know, the April has a membership of president of 57 uh, leading university from Asia Pacific Rim region. This includes more than 2 million students and more than 200,000 academic staff. So, April Sustainable Waste Management Global Lecture Series is designed to provide a sound foundation in basic principle and unifying research across ecology to conservation and environmental health to waste management while paying more attention to ESG. ESG denote for environmental, social, and governance and global sustainability. Particularly, uh, some related topic will be discussed through the April Sustainable Waste Management Global Lecture Series focusing on environmental pillar at ESG. So the key topic of our April uh, sustainable Waste Management Global Lecture Series are uh, conservation, ecology, environmental chemistry, environmental health, environmental resource management, water science, global sustainability, life cycle assessment. So as you, uh, you know, uh, we have currently tried to carry out a variety of programs designed to accelerate academic activity and international cooperation. So our program is a part of regular range of event offered by April Sustainable Waste Management Program and is designed to offer the audience an inside view of cutting edge uh, research topic. Uh, I believe uh, participants will be able to learn from and interact with world renowned scientists around the world uh, through this lecture series. I also hope that this event will become a valuable opportunity to extend and share friendship uh, among those who participate in this webinar. And today is a very special day, and we have a very important MOU uh, together with our presenter uh, that we've been looking for the environmental pillar at ESG, focusing on soil biodiversity. Uh, Dr. Yuan, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Ho. Uh, today, also Professor Huai Chuan Ang from the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, is joining as a panelist for this lecture. Uh, I would like to welcome Professor Ang 
uh, for this session and my sincere appreciation for joining uh, with us today. Before uh, today's lecture, we would like to play a short video to introduce the API program, right. uh, which uh, not only presents the voice of knowledge and innovation for the Asia Pacific region, um, but also brings together thought leader, research, and policymakers to exchange ideas and collaborate on effective solution to the challenge of 21st century. Uh, century. Today's challenges are too big and too complex to solve alone. No one person can cure cancer. No one country can clean up our oceans. And no one leader can end inequality. But when we work together, there's no end to what we can accomplish. We need to create opportunities for bright minds to come together and inspire each other to bring together diverse insights and leading innovation to craft the new solutions we need for the socioeconomic and environmental challenges we face. And to make sure our leading institutions have a voice in shaping a sustainable and inclusive future. That's the ambition of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, to be that voice of knowledge and innovation for Asia Pacific and the world. We connect the leading universities of the Pacific Rim and enable them to work together to address our society's biggest concerns. We foster engagement with government, leading to better policy. We cultivate links with enterprise, growing the impact of research. We are agents of change. We challenge assumptions. We bridge cultural divides. We bring new thinking to big issues. We are the voice of knowledge and innovation for Asia Pacific and the world. Uh, now we will move to the third lecture of our Global Lecture Series. And it is really a great honor for me to introduce our speaker for today. And Dr. Carlos Guerra from uh, ID in German. So before we start the lecture, I'd like to give a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Carlos, and he is a researcher at German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research, and received his PhD from York Evora. He is an uh, ecologist focused on predicting and evaluating the effect of global change driver on soil biodiversity. In the past few years, he has co-led a global initiative the Global Soil Biodiversity Observation Network to identify and close global gap in soil biodiversity knowledge. He works in the uh, interface between scale from local to global and discipline from ecology to risk management to develop a better understanding of soil process and soil biodiversity drivers. So, uh, Carlos, can you give some uh, brief uh, introduction for the, our MOU before you start your presentation? Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Professor Ock. Um, I, I really enjoyed the video that you showed because it says something to the fact that we cannot solve issues, the current issues alone. And this is uh, particularly true for uh, soil research and soil biodiversity research. It's impossible to do um currently it's impossible to have global any global indicator working uh, alone as a single institution and particularly because we all come from different different cultures we have all different um uh, ways of interacting with nature with our own institutions and uh coming from europe I, I already know for a fact that I cannot reach, for example, the Asian community or the South American community in the same way that I can reach my colleagues here. So having strategic partnerships with um, institutions in Asia or in other parts of the world is critical for us. So I, I very much welcome the MOU that we are establishing between the two, uh, these two initiatives. Yeah, thank you very much. And now, uh uh it's over to you so please uh, go ahead for your presentation and again thank you very much for accepting our invitation during your busy schedule thank you very much 
And uh, a part of this is also to to let you know in in, in the follow up of uh, what you're saying is that you can participate. Uh, so the people listening, you can participate in different ways in this in this um, mechanism. The uh, so April is participating more actively as a, a core lab for a specific set of analysis, but you can also participate by sending samples. Or, for example, we can also provide you with um, support on establishing your own national uh, monitoring program. We also want to contribute to that. Um, but and, and as you will see in, in a second, uh, the Asia-Pacific region is not that well represented in most macroecological analysis, and we want to overcome that. This is a first step to do that. Uh, so thank you for the invitation um, to to the lecture. I will try to do a, um, a summary of r recent advancements in uh, soil microecology that actually led to the paper that uh, Professor Hawk was um, referring to. So these the, these the, these things cannot happen disconnected, and most of the uh, most times require a bit of build up. To be actually uh, put in place, and this is what I'm uh, trying to to do today. So, um, because I don't know your exact backgrounds, and I, I, but I imagine that they are a bit diverse. I just wanted to understand what I, what I, when I refer to soils, what I mean. That's at least for you to understand the rest of the lecture. So, soils are a complex system, and they actually rely on scale to. Uh, so their ecological properties manifest in different ways depending on the scale that you are looking at them. Here you see on the left a plant with, their, with its root system and at that, at that scale you already can find and see uh, lots of uh, the ecological um, processes that we will speak about. But soils actually interact at very uh, different scales to the very tiniest scale, in this case, an aggregate in the right, on the right, to the macro scale when it interacts with the, when the plant or uh, soil system interacts with the landscape. What happens at all these scales is that soils in reality interact with their environment like any other ecosystem, and they interact with their environment not only at the very local scale, but also at macroecological scales. So what I'm going to show you today, or what I'm going to the, discuss with you today, is not at the aggregate level, but it's at the macroecological scale. So these interactions that happen at very large scales that influence the way that soil ecology works and uh, that the distribution of uh, um, soil biodiversity is, um, you know, it's managed at that scale, at those scales. So. The other component of this that I would like you to understand is that soils alone, although you can look at them and think that they do not do anything or they are limited in their contributions to us, actually contribute a lot to what we benefit uh, as a society, not only in terms of food, because that's the most apparent one is with fertilization, but also in terms of carbon sequestration, in terms of uh, mitigating the effects of pollution, in terms of what we get, in terms of um, uh, being able to have a more or less stable landscape, soils interact with us without many times without us knowing in many different ways, and we have to find ways to accommodate that in in in, in a certain way. So far, these these ways have been through agriculture. So, in in terms of trying to establish more sustainable management practices. We are trying to move that conversation to something that is more related to nature conservation as for other ecosystems. To do that, we have to understand two things. We have to understand the distribution of what uh, of soil biodiversity, of global hotspots of soil biodiversity, but we also have to understand what drives soil biodiversity. And a good colleague of mine, uh, Matthias, published recently a paper in Science where he did a meta-analysis together with an ex experimental setup to understand what drives, what really drives um, soil biodiversity. Is it pollution? So are the pressures from pollution greater than the pressures from 
uh, let's say, climate change. And what he found is that irrespectively of the type of driver that you consider, the critical aspect there is to consider the accumulation of drivers. So when you have a place where multiple drivers accumulate, you have more pressure uh, to the soil. And when you have a, a place where an, a lower number of drivers, smaller number of drivers um, is present, you have less pressure uh, against that soil. This also shows that we have to be very careful when evaluating soils and we need more holistic approaches. This is also what we are trying to do uh, at this global level with this global monitoring is not only looking at one specific feature of soil biodiversity, but it's specifically looking at the overall uh, description of what is inside the soil. And I'll show you a slide on that in a second. So he here, he, uh, um, uh, Matthias and, and others have identified critical aspects that we have to focus on. Not only because they are poorly described in the literature, but also because they apparently have the biggest impacts. Things like increased aridity or increased water erosion or increased land, uh, land use change with uh, elements related to, pollutions, to pollution. That, those elements are the elements that we probably need to focus more in terms of what we are looking at, in terms of uh, describing soils and their interactions with the environment. But these are also aspects that require um, macroecological answers, not only uh, local answers. So locally, you cannot um, face climate change. Locally, you cannot uh, stop. You can stop the deforestation on your land, but global deforestation, this is not a problem that you cannot solve locally. It, it requires global solutions. The problem with... Uh, soil biodiversity and uh, soil biodiversity conservation from a nature conservation point of view is that current nature conservation is focused on protecting above ground organisms and the assumption is that if you protect a forest for example or an eagle or the habitat for the eagle for the eagle you are conversely protecting the soils and protecting soil ecosystems and their um, biodiversity what we are finding is that this is not necessarily truth. So what you see here is a map of the globe that uh, uh, on the so on the blue gradient uh, shows uh, soil biodiversity, and on the yellow gradient shows above ground diversity. Black spots is are where you have both. So you have both high soil and above ground diversity, and blue spots and yellow spots are where you have high either um, below ground diversity or above ground diversity and as you can see although you, we have lots of black spots we we also have significant a significant amount of either blue or yellow this means that you are basically if you favor the yellow parts for above ground diversity you are favoring areas where you are protecting above ground diversity but you are not doing anything for below ground diversity. And uh, because we are in uh, with the community of Asia uh, and the Pacific, if, if you can, if you look specifically to the left or to the right part of the map, you will see that the expectation, the models, what they expect is that below ground diversity surpasses the amount of diversity that you have above ground. So protecting one, does not mean necessarily that you are protecting the other. And this is quite critical when you're establishing a global program for the soil conservation. The other aspect of this is how can we feed? How are we feeding these types of assessments? How are we feeding these types of models or our understanding of the world below ground? And recently we published in a paper in Nature Communication where we try to um, summarize the volume of macroecological studies that is out there and try to understand where are they capturing what what is what where are the regions where the data comes from and um, unfortunately not to our surprise we found that there are gigantic disparities in terms of the groups that are assessed 
uh, there are important gaps in terms of uh, functionality, for example, and there are important regional gaps. So, for example, although it may seem that, for example, a continent like Africa has some information, the amount of information uh, present in most of these studies is almost irrelevant for the overall modeling. So I don't know if you are aware of how the most models work. Most models work. Uh, so the, most models model well around the average. And if you have a skewed distribution towards, for example, Europe, you will get your European map very well done. But then the rest of the world is just a mimic of what is the expectation for Europe. And this is what is happening in most assessments. And this is what we don't want to have at, um, uh, in soil bonds or in the, our global uh, monitoring. The other aspect of this is, if you look at the, the right, is the a volume of data. So for the same sites that has, at the same time, both functional data and uh, biodiversity data is very, very small. So it's just a very small number of papers and a very small number of sites that contain at the same time uh, diversity data and functional data. And this is quite a, a problem because we normally, right now, we, we protect soils because of the services or the ecosystem services that we get from them. So the functions that we get from them. And these understanding how these are linked to biodiversity is critical for us to move the conversation from protecting functions to protect diversity. And because we cannot establish those links properly, at least in, in large scales, that this conversation is harder and harder. Today, and uh, I'm happy that it's, it's becoming easier to show those relationships and we are getting more and more um, information on this both on both these two realities but but still it's something that we have to explore and we have to open for the future um despite of that there's have been lots of um, uh, excitement in the past decade or so for soil biodiversity not excitement in general but from very um enthusiastic people enthusiastic researchers that between going around the world and collecting soils by themselves or doing meta-analysis, so collecting uh, papers that others have published, have managed to create in, enough data and uh, pull enough information to uh, try to understand the macroecological patterns of soils. So in 2014, we started with fungi, with Leo Tetherso, and more recently with um, earthworms and Helen Phillips, we have we, we are we start we are starting to have information about the global patterns of um, uh, soil biodiversity, and, and it's, we are also collaborating with um, Anton Potapov that is doing uh, the same for Columbia. So he's doing a meta analytical assessment for Columbia. Um, I'm going to show you some of these patterns because they are important for you to understand how we are looking at soils and what we are trying to do. So, as I told you, in the beginning, this was done uh, with a very uh, small pool of uh, uh, sample sites. So, by comparison, I don't know if you're um, uh, aware of what is being done, for example, for plant ecology. It's fairly easy to get um, a data set, global data set with more than 10,000 locations where you have um, um, the diversity and the composition of plants. So currently, it's, that's very easy. The equivalent for soils is to get a data set with 300 samples. So we are, we are in two different worlds in terms of what we can do and what we can say about soil ecology. But still, it's, it's important that we make some advancements. So this is, this is the uh, first attempt to describe the um, fungi diversity across the world. This is, was published by Leo Tedderson in 2014. And then later in 2019, we started seeing the emergence of other uh, groups. So being treated individually, but the emergence of other groups like bacteria or like um, nematodes um, 
from uh, from both from um, Delgado Macariso or Van der Hoeven. These efforts are quite different, and the reason why I put these two together is that uh, while the nem uh, the, the um, description of nematodes comes with about 6,000 locations, they come from a meta-analysis. So they come from very different ways of measuring things. They come from very different ways of assessing what is there. But on the, on the right, this assessment comes with 300 locations, but all of these locations were treated exactly in the same way, in a very standardized way, and allows for other types of questions to be explored. This is what we aim with our initiative, um, or it's closer to what we aim with our initiative at the global scale, is to have a standardized way of looking at soils that allows us to do research in a different level. More recently, so after this um, uh, nematode uh, uh, paper, uh, I participated in a different effort to accumulate data on uh, soil earthworms. What we explore there, that it's, again different from the previous attempts is that it's not only about richness but it's also about the abundance of individuals and later on about the the beta diversity so the dissimilarity between individuals so as you can see on the top map the overall predicted richness is quite low in places that you would not expect like the tropics but the the hints that we got from the data. So this is this comes from the type of data that was used here. It was um, again a meta analysis with very diverse ways of measuring diversity. But what we are getting on the background of this data is information that while the diversity seems to be low, what happens in the tropics, for example, is that when you go from site one to site two, you get completely different species. So lo the local number of species may be small, let's say three species here and three species there. These three species are completely different. While in a place like Europe, you may have more species. So let's say that you have four or five species in one place and the other, but these are quite common between these two sites. So overall, we, we have more diversity in the tropics, although these, for example, these characterizations don't see it at the moment. And we are trying to establish new ways of looking at that. So moving on, again, what, you, what we have to understand here is that for us to be able to preserve soil biodiversity, we have to understand where this diversity is, but also what are the impacts to soils in, in large scales. So what we tried to define a, a few years ago was a way to properly calculate this in an indicator type of way. So something that could be directly used, for example, for accounting in terms of how, how, um, uh, how much services are being delivered by um, the different uh, ecosystem types that we have. So for although the, the names may be uh, a bit strange, I kept them like this because it allows me to go over the presentation. And what I need you to focus here is on the bottom figure here. So the way that we calculate this in terms of how much ecosystem services are provided is the following way. We calculate the amount of impact that would be there if no ecosystem service was provided. So we have to, for this, we have to identify what, what are our ecosystem service providers. So let's say that they are plants, for example, and we model everything without plants. So we obtain what is here called structural impact. So the amount of impact that would be there if no ecosystem service provider would be in this, in this ecosystem. Then what we calculate is the same amount of impact. So this uh, mitigated impact. So it's the amount of impact that remains after the service is provided. And what is here is the, so the actual provision is what the ecosystem service provider, again, let's say a plant, gives us in terms of service. This allows us, for example, to establish a, a framework that for a manager, if a land manager can somehow influence how this ecosystem service provider, so like, let's say, like the plants, how the plants provide the service that the he wants, he or she wants, 
then he can either uh, in, increase the amount of service that he gets, or he can see the reflection of his bad practices in deteriorating the ecosystem service that that he's aiming for. So we did this in different ways from uh, small, we apply this framework in different ways from small scale to large scales. And here is an example where what we try to understand here is how much policy, so we mapped through time the different policies that were implemented in a specific region. This is in the south of Portugal. And we also map the land cover and land use changes across uh, 60 years of um, data that we had. And we try to understand how are these changes reflecting or not the different policies. And what we found here is that uh, there, there are, so in the top you have these uh, policy changes and you don't have to, uh, to know all this, all this, but you have, what you have to understand here is that in the 80s and the 90s, there were some uh, agricultural policy reforms that actually improved or uh, uh, suggested that farmers went from uh, cereal crops to permanent pastures. And this shift made the, so what, what happened with this shift is that farmers went from producing um, wheat, for example, to produce cattle in a very large scale type of way. And what we see here is that Although the amount of impact that would be there uh, is uh, without any plants, so without any ecosystem service providers, would our expectation is that it would re be reduced through time? What happens to the actual impact that was uh, so that was reflected in the field is that it, it increases. So what we have is the disconnection between what is climatically so climatically driven so in this case the amount of impact that was there uh, without any plant um, uh, being in the field and the amount of impact that was actually uh, affecting the farmer there's a disconnect between these two and this is because once you get uh, grazing so once you get permanent pastures the pressure of grazing is so high that it favors, in this case, soil erosion. That's what we are describing here. And it, it does not favor the protection or the retention of soils. The same analysis can be applied at large scale. So this is an example from the Mediterranean basin where we took the same approach and we tried to understand what uh, was happening here. And uh, because in the beginning uh, we were discussing uh, with Professor Hawk the um, um, issues related to economy and how uh, big companies can are uh, listening or looking more to this, what what was interesting for us is that it's not the overall assessment; is what happens between 2009 and 2013. So this is, and this is the the map that you see here on the bottom. What happened economically? was that there was the crash in the US in 2008, and then it spread out through Europe, particularly through the south of Europe uh, in, in the following years. And in the following years, what happened also for countries like Spain or, with, or for Portugal is that the amount of land abandonment was so high and the amount of unemployment was so high that what we saw there is a regrowth of vegetation. So the, although we have, in this case, in this large scale assessment, although we have an increase between these two years of the overall impact if no vegetation was there, what we have here in reality is a decrease, and, um, uh, decrease on the volume of soil being eroded just because of this effect of um, an economic crash. I'm not saying that I would like to have another economic crash. That's not what I'm saying. And uh, it's just that we can track the effects of both policy and economy through soils and through the impacts on soils. That's, I would say, my main message here. Um, while we do this locally, we can do this more regional scale, but we can also upscale this type of assessments to a global scale assessment where we can see the regions of the world that are most affected by, um, again, in this case, it's soil erosion. So to maintain the same um, uh, 
type of ecological process. So we can see what is happening across time and what is happening in terms of the process that is behind this and what are the regions that are more affected by this. On the top, you can see the differences in terms of soil protection. So this means the differences in terms of the amount of vegetation present in a specific pixel between 2001 and 2013. And in the panel C here, you see that overall, globally, what we have, although some regions have increases on, on this amount of vegetation, what we have globally is a push for a decrease in terms of this vegetation coverage. This push for a negative trend comes mostly from the global south. And this is quite problematic for us to, to, to understand because or it's critical for us to understand that different regions are affected in different ways. So when we are discussing global policies, we, we often have to take a step back, look at the type of data that we are getting and understand that different regions, different countries are not in the same position in terms of how they are already affected and how they will be affected by global change factors. Here as a second stage, so here is what we would call previously the ecosystem service providers. So this we are uh, trying to assess the amount of vegetation that is there. In the second step, what we are trying to understand is where where is this erosion? So what are the differences in actual erosion from the in 2001 to 2013? And, and these differences are calculated globally. So what this means is that uh, we account for the effects of climate, so if you have more precipitation or less, and we account for the effects of vegetation. And what you see is that with the decrease of the amount of vegetation present, although it's decreasing in different parts of the world, this decrease sometimes comes from climate effects. It's not only that we are cutting trees, it's basically that, for example, in some cases, aridity is increasing, and with that, the uh, it's decreasing the amount of vegetation that we have. And what we then see is that erosion, so the push for a positive trend comes from different regions. So while, for example, in, let's say, South Africa, you, you were seeing here a decrease in the amount of vegetation, this comes from expanding arid regions, uh, mostly. Uh, what, what happens is that if you don't have enough precipitation, you also don't have soil erosion. You have other types of erosion, but not water erosion like you are seeing here. So what we are seeing is that we have to focus, we have to first be very careful on how we interpret our indicators, and then we have to focus our actions where these uh, impacts are really occurring and preventing others from occurring in the future. Because we are going to talk about soil biodiversity, what I'm what I'll do now is I'll try to connect changes in this case in soil erosion to what is what you saw before in terms of um, soil biodiversity. Because so soil erosion is a process that happens when so there's a moment where soil biodiversity declines, the system itself starts to fail, and then you start losing soil. There are specific events where you lose soil independently of the system uh, wellness, but in most cases you have you first lose the ecological performance of soils, and then you uh, you lose soil on itself, and this soil is transported to other places and it does harm or not independent dependent uh, on on the place that it uh, lands. But for us, what was uh, interesting was to explore how these patterns in soil erosion match the patterns or the expected patterns in uh, soil biodiversity. And if you see these two panels, so B and C here in the middle, what you, if and if you focus on the red parts, so red parts are areas with high soil erosion and high, soil, high expected soil biodiversity. And what you see is that most of Asia is affected by high soil erosion and high um, uh, soil biodiversity. So it, these are areas where we expect to find high levels of soil uh, biodiversity, but are also areas where soil erosion is high. So we expect to have um, a significant impact in these regions. 
But these impacts don't come necessarily from things that we can individually control. So if you look at the top level map, so here on the top, you'll see that most of these increases in soil erosion come from negative climate effects. So come from increases in precipitation, increases in extreme events, and do not come necessarily only from changes in the vegetation patterns. This, these are also important, but at a large scale, these things come mostly from climate effects. And this bears the importance of us dealing with this climate change um, uh, issue that we currently have and we will have in the future because it will uh, step by step degrade our soils and step by step creating other problems for our societies that we are still not uh, looking at. Um, what we are trying also to do is to move the discussion step by step from processes like soil erosion to effective uh, soil biodiversity assessments and effective soil biodiversity monitoring. Here we try to look at the overall um, distribution of data points that we have for, in this case, bacteria and fungi. This comes from this uh, bacteria paper that I mentioned before, where 300, uh, around 300 locations were standard, uh, standardized and uh, monitored in a very standard way or surveyed in a very standard way. And from those samples, we try to understand what was the proportion of uh, soil pathogens, mostly fungi, and what was driving the, that uh, pathogen proportion. So is it expected that we have more um, pathogens in a warmer climate or not? That was our main question in the background. And as you can see in panel B here on the bottom, what this is a structural equation model that basically takes all the samples that are here on the top, and tries to understand what are what is what are the individual direct or indirect influences of different uh, drivers, and you don't have to know the names, but MAT means a mean annual temperature. This is the strongest effect that we have, both direct and indirect, on pathogens. So the expectation and it's positive. So what this means is that with increase in temperature. The expectation is that we see an increase with uh, on the proportion of pathogens, but climate change doesn't happen globally everywhere in the same way. So we wanted to understand it, two things. First, if this increase was is real, so can we establish a, um, an experiment that shows for a particular ecosystem that if we increase temperature, we will get more pathogens? to validate this type of results. And second, we wanted to understand what is the global distribution of this uh, potential increase in pathogens. Um, for the experimental side, what, we, what uh, we did was we took an experimental setup that was already um, um, set up. So it was already there for a couple of years, coming from the Maestre lab in, in Spain. And what they did was for they collected samples in specific areas and they collected samples outside and inside these contraptions. And what these contraptions do is that they increase the temperature for about two degrees Celsius. So the idea here is that for any given condition that you have in the press, in the, in the, any given day, out, outside it's going to be uh, colder by around two degrees than inside these contraptions. And what we saw is the exact effect that we were seeing in this global scale data. We saw that our control, so outside of the contraptions, is has systematically and significantly less pathogens, less proportion of pathogens than inside these contraptions where the two degrees uh, increase uh, is set up. So with this knowledge and with the confidence that we could um, use Available, the available data to map and to understand what was happening in the global scale, we try to first establish our conceptual framework that with increase uh, temperature, you basically increase the aridity of the, the, the sites and you have potentially more uh, pathogens. But we also understand that globally, these things don't happen in the same way everywhere. But, and because of that, we, we First, we mapped the distribution, the potential distribution of um, uh, relative abundance of pathogens. So, if you, so red means higher proportion of pathogens 
uh, blue means lower proportion of pathogens. It follows more or less the expected um, distribution that we were at least expecting uh, based on the data that we got. What was surprising to us was what we saw next. So once we took the models that we used to model current distribution, and we used future climate and future land use to predict what would happen in the future, we were expecting a more diverse picture. So we were expecting places where we would find, so large, large places where we would find losses, large places where we would find increases. And to our surprise, what we found was that in, so dark red means that all the models that we use, all the possible futures that we consider, turn out to be uh, increases in uh, soil pathogens. So a large proportion of the world is expected to increase the number of the proportion of soil pathogens in both um, natural and managed systems uh, in, in, the, in a very systematic way, independently of the future that we choose. So SSP1 means that we have, uh, this is the, the aim future at the moment. So this is what we aim to get if we implement all climate measures. But even for that future, the expectation is that we get an increase in pathogens, a smaller increase though, but it's still an increase. And then what you see in the rest of the world is a mixture of um, some models, some futures imply uh, an increase, some other futures imply um, reductions or uh, mixed in terms between in, uh, between these two uh, examples. Uh, so all of what you, I showed you so far is based on the fact that we look at biodiversity from a pattern point of view, so what is happening currently. And then what I try to show you is what drives um, soil systems or what is impacting soil systems and based on the information that we are now collecting, how are these uh, ecological communities going to evolve through the future? I showed you a very specific example for pathogens because pathogens are quite important for uh, the benefits that we get. But this can also be done to understand how overall communities, so in this case, the example that I'm showing you here, here is for bacteria, how overall communities are expected to evolve in the future. To, know, to learn more information about that, as I showed you in the example for earthworms, it's not uh, useful to look only at diversity, so not only at richness, because richness gives us an idea of what is out there, but does not give us an idea of if these communities are expected to be different or less, uh, so more different or less different. So what we found here is that while, so on the, middle panel is uh, richness. So it's it's expected that uh, in, the, in the past to, until today and from today to the future, overall bacteria richness is supposed to increase. So bacteria richness is local level. So for every single sample, it's supposed to, we are expected that uh, richness increases. But what happens also is that although richness increases, we are also expected to see a decrease in the diversity of these species of, of these communities. So what happens is that two samples now become less uh, diverse, less diverse, no, less different between them. So we get more homogeneous samples, and we get more homogeneous, um, uh, uh, less homogeneous communities. What we uh, and for us this is a um, a step in the right direction. So to understand how not only where we have highly rich communities, but also where we have quite dissimilar communities that we should maybe protect, not only because they have high richness, but also because they, are, they have specific species that don't exist elsewhere. So I will finish my presentation now, or I'll try to finish my presentation now by uh, by returning basically to the beginning of it. So in the beginning, we were discussing the, the partnership that we are establishing with APRU and uh, how will this allow us to look forward in different ways, hopefully also in for the Asian Pacific community. What we 
know already is that the way that we conceptualize soils and we conceptualize how we look at soils has to change and has been changing in the last 10 years. I hope that you got that picture. But even though it has been changing, it's only considering, uh, so it's, it's, it's um, aggregating soils as if we were looking at forests and trees. Unfortunately, soils are more like the ocean than like a forest. So soils, as, as I was uh, telling you in the beginning, soils are different when you consider depth. So for example, if you're considering the first five centimeters of soils, you will see something that is completely different if you go to one meter. And we are not doing anything yet to uh, that regard. We, are, we don't have... Uh, large-scale data that allows us to monitor soils, so to know what are the differences between the current conditions and the tomorrow's conditions or in the past 10 years' conditions. That is something that we are not uh, looking at. We are not still, it's difficult at least, to look at uh, diversity and function interaction. So how are these communities built in terms of uh, how how do we have diverse communities that provide relevant services or functions to us. All of these aspects are still open questions um, in soil microbiological, microbiological research. If you aggregate all those questions, you, you, will, you will, let's say, this is like a summary of that. So you have to understand how landscapes and landscape level dynamics determine soil biodiversity and functions. This is something that is much more open to explore. A second aspect of this is how are soils, so the communities inside the soils, determining how the landscapes are formed? Because in some le at some levels you have better plant performance, you have some plants that cannot be in specific soils because of the communities that are there. And the other aspect is how are these communities evolving through time together with the landscapes? So are we, do we have enough change in landscape that uh, has an effect on the changes in the in soil communities or for example and this uh, what is called legacy effects so when you destroy a forest you still have a forest community in the soil for a long time after you destroy the forest so these these dynamics these questions are uh, open and are um, open for us also to collaborate if if, if that's comes to fruition. Um, so coming exactly back to the beginning, what we are trying to, so answering these questions requires not only goodwill, but requires data and quite precise and standardized data. And this is what we proposed with our uh, paper in science recently, but most, most importantly, this is what is the, this is the work of a collective of individuals and institutions that work together to propose something that could um, move policymakers in the right direction of how to look at soils. And here on the figure on the, on the right, you can see that on the left part of that figure, we propose a set of uh, essential biodiversity variables. The name essential biodiversity variables causes some confusion, but this, is, this comes from the specific organization where we come from. And what this means is that these are priority variables. This does not mean that we are only going to look at them, uh, that, uh, only going to look at these. It means that these are the basic priority building blocks of what we are trying to look at so, uh, from a soils perspective, but these are not limited only to this. And from the and on the right side, you see we will see several more diversity related uh, variables that we want to to show. For me, the critical part of this and where also our collaboration with April comes in is that we will be able to, in the future, take one soil sample and from that one soil sample, look at a variety of different things, different aspects, different elements of uh, soils and how soils interact with uh, the diversity that is above ground and how soils interact with us. And for us to be able to do that, it's like in the beginning, we cannot, we cannot do that alone. 
We have to do that in the, as a community. We have to build this as a way of uh, creating a community of practice that allows researchers from around the world to collaborate in a very effective way, in a very um, uh, friendly way to establish um, soil microecology as a field in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great lecture, Dr. Perra. Now we can start the Q&A &A session. If you have any questions, you could send your question uh, uh, using uh, chat function or Q&A uh, function. Uh, if not, uh, you may raise your hand so that we will allow you to talk with the speaker directly. Uh, to start this session, I would like to invite Professor Huai Chuan Ang to initiate the uh, discussion. Hi, Professor, over to you. Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Carol, uh, for the very interesting talk. So it's very impressive, and we have learned a lot about the uh, soil microbiology and also the monitoring. So now we would like to start the Q&A question. So actually, I have received one question from the graph. So his question is about, uh, to ask Dr. Carol, what is your opinion on the soil biodiversity in the top affected soil under the climate change? So okay. we, uh, we haven't studied that yet. Um, of course, I haven't studied that yet. Yeah. What, what is what's um, um, what I can say about that is that for for a long time there are some um, there's there's an entire literature about um, indicator species that are used in uh, salt um, affected soils or other types of uh, soils that are affected by um, either other types of nutrients, and I know that uh, there is research on um, uh, Flexes, so indicator species that can uh, be used to either track salted, salt affected uh, soils or by you know, monitor the impacts of those soils. I'm, personally, I didn't, I, I haven't explored it, that question. Oh, okay, thank you. So I see the another participant. This is the Gu Wan Kong. He raised the hand. So, yeah, here you want to ask the question directly or not? Yes, thank you for your great presentation. And I wonder about if the biodiversity of the soil can be changed by a variety of factors. Uh, is there a way to separate and assess the change in biodiversity caused by natural activities such as tsunami or volcanoes rather than human activities? Yes, I. Th I, I th my first answer would be yes. Um, I think you have to establish an experiment to um, eliminate other uh, confounding factors, but I think it's it's possible. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, in areas with active volcanoes, for example, you mentioned the volcanoes, there's, there are specific ways where you can um, sample the soils and protect some parts of the soils to understand what is the effect of ash deposition, for example. This is something that uh, can be done. Also, because of the first slide, when I showed that uh, soils vary at a very, very small scale. So if you sample at smaller scales, you, you will get a more valid results. So yes. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. OK, thank you. So I have received another question uh, from the Paul Park. So I, I saw the pop up here. I'd like to ask a question like that. You saw your question is a bit lag. Um, hello, Professor Carlos. Um, thank you so much for your amazing lecture today. I have a question regarding the policy concerning soil bi biodiversity. Um, since Earth has a very diverse type of so soil configuration, climate, and vegetation, etc., and these are also changing all the time, it seems like it could be a little bit difficult to find every single appropriate soil or agriculture policy to be applied to based on the different um, circumstances and regions of the world. So um, in your opinion, do you think there are ways that we can generalize or standardize policy regarding this? Or are there any um, scientific tools that are being used to effectively and efficiently analyze the different conditions of parts of the world and its constantaneous changes? Um, thank you very much. So um, yes. Uh, 
what we so you, I'll, I'll split your question into two parts. There's there's for sure a diversity of soil conditions and soil biodiversity that um, when we speak globally exists, but this is the same as for any other um, ecosystem feature. So if you if you, or ecological group, if you talk about plants or if you talk about birds, this is the same thing applies. Gen generalization comes from identifying indicators that are commonly applied everywhere and that allows either land managers or policymakers to actually track the effects of their management or policy plans. This is what we try to do for the soil erosion specifically when we mapped these um, uh, different policies because we wanted to show to policymakers that their policies, although they were not targeting soil erosion or soils specifically, they were having, in this case, detrimental effects on soils um, in, in this particular region. And and we, if we establish these indicators, if we if we monitor them, if we track them through time, we can show this to policymakers, and we can allow uh, these things to correct. From where I stand, what we need as a generalization measure is to stop looking at so not stop. It's to uh, we have to continue to look at soils from a management perspective. We have to still have sustainable management practices to preserve soils. But we have to shift part of that conversation from an active management to active conservation management. So we, we have to establish areas. And actually in Germany, they have a few that already are in that direction where some places are established as conservation areas, not because they have a specific bird, but because they have a specific earthworm. Because there are some earthworms that don't exist anywhere else in the world. And if you lose them, you lose them, for example. Or the same thing goes for other uh, soil animals. So what I'm saying is that not that we should stop the conversation about sustainable management, is that part of that conversation should sh shift to something else related to conservation. But yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, all right. I have received another question from Eugene Kim. His question is about uh, Dr. Carroll. It's mentioned ab about the aim of your study is to change the policy maker on how they look at the soil. So, what may be the some example of the policy regarding the soil conservation? So, uh, we are now actually working uh, uh, with some partners uh, towards the convention of bi um, biological diversity to. Uh, again, shift this conversation from sustainable, not shift, shift part of the conversation from sustainable management to um, active uh, nature conservation. That shift requires two things. Requires that we um, establish, flex, for example, flagship species for soils that should be preserved. We, it's established, we need to first establish also uh, global hotspots of uh, biological diversity for soils. These things are not there yet. Uh, and for a policymaker to make a decision based on assumptions of, without any information is quite hard. So a measure that we can establish prior to that is to put soil biodiversity first in their agenda. This is the first step. The second step is to put their in their agenda not only from uh, let's do this and this in this policy. It's more in terms of what we aim to have in ten years. So in ten years' time, what we are working with them to have is a monitoring system that allows to focus on soils, not only on other species, but specifically on soils and soil communities. And we are also working with them to uh, get their uh, buy-in into that. In 10 years' time, we can have protected areas that focus also specific on, specifically on soils. And for the protected areas that we have at the moment, that we can have management strategies that favor soil species. And it can be very simple things from a management perspective. So a, a, a protected area manager, for example, when it's managing a, a forest, if it leaves the dead wood on the soil, it would generate habitat for soil organisms. It's not about just increasing diversity or it's about managing that specific diversity and expanding the habitat for that specific diversity. So there are some policy level things that are still requiring some development from our side 
um, but we can already move towards at least having goals and establishing a global goal of having a monitoring system for soil biodiversity is a critical one. And the second one is to have within the nature conservation policy specific orientations to either include or promote soil biodiversity within those. Those I think we can uh, achieve. Okay, thank you. So I also received another question, all right, from Hidaya Sula. So the question is about for the assessment and monitoring of the soil biodiversity globally, could you please explain the sampling technique used uh, for the earthworm, bacteria, and, uh, and fungi global distribution? So we are using uh, an approach there that is uh, that boils down to the following. Um, the, so if you contribute to us, to our initiative, the research is yours, the soil is yours, the data is yours, Everything is yours. You just allows us. To, you, just, you are just allowing us to use it. That's all. And by doing that, you are also collaborating with us. So uh, we we are focusing a lot on benefit transfer mechanisms, and these benefit transfer mechanisms can be realized from uh, having you as a, a close collaborator in our, for example, in our research, in our papers, uh, or having you as a, a close collaborator in, in terms of establishing other monitoring um, uh, uh, approaches in your own countries. Uh, having this link is quite important. It's quite laborious. It's not something that uh, we will just ask you for a sample. Because, for example, in countries like Indonesia, for example, it's quite difficult, I would say impossible, to take a soil sample and ship it to us without you committing a crime. So. This is this is something that we really have to. There are some barriers that we have to overcome, and we require and we need the uh, local partners to do that. For the sampling itself, we are also working in an approach that you in Korea, someone else in Kenya, and someone else here in Germany have to have the same conditions. So what we are going to do, I, unfortunately, I don't have it with me right now. What we are going to do, we are going to do is we are going to send a box to everyone. Yeah with everything inside. And yeah. you just have to sample the soils. It's a very simple procedure. You put the soils in the box and you send it to us. You yeah, don't do anything good. else apart from that and apart from collaborating with us to, to ensure that we met all the legal requirements in your yeah. own country to sample the soils. Um, overall, this is uh, our, so the, the, everything happens after you sample. So yeah. after you sample, soils arrive in Germany and then they are distributed across the world for different labs that will do standardized measures on all these samples. And then from that, you will receive your data and then you can do whatever you want with that data. That's the plan. Yep. Yeah, that's a very good idea. So I received another question from the, well, uh, Pavani. Oh, okay, thank you very much for the uh, interesting presentation, Dr. Guerra. Uh, actually, currently, uh, environmental pillar in ESG has gained uh, more attention by the investors and global companies, uh, but the weight given for environmental pillar is not clear and uh, like um, and limited weight is given. So I would like to know your perspective on the weight given for biodiversity in current environmental pillar assessment criteria and what are the possible challenges when integrating above ground and below ground diversity in the pillar assessment? So, uh, I'm not sure if you are aware there's this system called BIP. BIP stands for Biodiversity Indicators Partnership, something like this. And what they, what they aim to is to propose specific indicators that are relevant for policymakers and eventually for uh, companies to assess their biodiversity impacts, basically. And not only impacts, but to assess the biodiversity status, but with that uh, impacts. Uh, the way that I see our contribution to that is to propose these essential biodiversity variables and the related indicators. These can be calculated on multiple scales. We are trying to do this globally, but I can imagine a, a national system where this information is also integrated in the same way with these things similar strategies 
and providing, uh, if not the same, similar indicators to both companies and uh, governments. What I don't think it's, um, um, so I've worked a bit, not too much with companies and we come from different directions and it's important to understand that. So the contribution that we can have to the different pillars of the SDGs, it's, it's, it's different. Uh, we come from a perspective, so I earn money, let's put it like this, by doing research. And in my interest is in doing research. So my curiosity is uh, understanding how communities and uh, different functions and what is the performance, what is their macro scale distribution. Companies come from a, 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 a different perspective. They come from a perspective of trying to mitigate their impacts on the world and not receiving you no know, fines or other types of um, economic drawbacks from their activities. Uh, the way that so far, and I still, I'm still young, so I, I may grow into something else, but so far the way that I see these two worlds uh, collaborating is to maintain some level of independence. So we can do an independent uh, research on the overall, let's say, distribution of, uh, let's say, soil biodiversity, and companies should try to find ways to fund that those initiatives to and find ways to maintain them independent because if they do that we can provide clear assessments that may or not be uh, detrimental for them but they they can have they can be informative and actually for most companies uh, professor Ock was mentioning for example lg i know that their perspective comes from a positive uh, side so they actually want to mitigate their impact so they prefer to have informative ways of mitigating their impacts than just a report that says that they are performing very well. So for companies that treat this subject in a very serious way, it's important to bring them to the, to, to the discussion, but trying to maintain these two things separate enough that we can contribute to the same, let's say, environmental goals, but from these two different perspectives. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I think we clear most of the questions. So, from the audience, do you have any other questions you want to ask, Dr. Carol? If you have a question and you are afraid of asking, you can always send me an email. I'll reply. Yeah. Yeah. If not, I think uh, I think we end the Q and A session now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carol answering all these questions uh, these very interesting sections yep, thank you thank you this is the end of uh, the third session of global lecture series uh, i would like to ex extend my sincere gratitude and appreciation to dr Gra uh, for your valuable and contribution and also for uh, sharing your knowledge during your um, busy schedules I also extend my special thanks to Professor Yong Se O oh for organizing this event. Mm, thank you, uh, all the panelists, Professor Ong, um, and the um, program leader, and all the participants for attending this event and bringing your expertise to this uh, gathering. Uh, thank you again. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.